What's up everybody, Rob here. So one of my favorite movies is The Last of the Mohicans starring Daniel Day-Lewis. It's a fantastic movie. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Now, the movie itself is based on a novel of the same name by James Fenmore Cooper, written back in the 1800s, and the central conflict of the story revolves around the siege and later massacre of the garrison at Fort William Henry during the French and Indian War. Now, this is an actual event that really did happen, however, the events have been dramatized for the film and the book. Now, I'm not going to be doing here is a comparison between the two, I'm just going to be telling you about the story that inspired, or the historical event that inspired the story that inspired Cooper to write his novel, which then later on led to the movie. Not a direct comparison, I'm just going to be talking about the siege and the fall of Fort William Henry and the subsequent massacre of its garrison. Alright, so that's it for the introductions, here we go. Alright, so as our story begins, things were not going well for the British war effort in North America during the Seven Years War, or as it is known in the US, the French and Indian War. The British were, in the southern theater of the war, well let's just say the uh, um, things were going very badly, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, up north, things were faring slightly better. The British did manage to push back French forces at the Battle of Lake George in September of 1755. It's called the Battle of Lake George. It's really more of a series of relatively small skirmishes, but, you know, a success is a success. So let's just, you know, chalk it up as a victory and uh, not think about it too much. So in any case, in response to all of this, the French fortified what ground they still held in what is now upstate New York, constructing Fort Carleon, which is now known as Fort Ticonderoga, along the shores of Lake Champlain. In response to this, the British dug into their holdings by constructing a fort on the southern shore of Lake George, which they named Fort William Henry. The fort would be supported by Fort Edward, which was located some 16 miles down the Hudson River. The designer of the fort, Major William Erie of the 44th Regiment of Foot, opted to make a square fort with bastions. It was ideal to repel skirmishers and Indian attacks, um, however, it really was not designed to withstand heavy artillery. Um, possibly this was due to simply time constraints and the materials that were available to him. Um, in any case, it would prove to be somewhat of a design flaw. The northern wall of the fort was protected by Lake George, and the other walls were protected by a large ditch that was dug around it. The fort could be accessed by a bridge located over the ditch. Now, by 1757, the French were preparing to launch a massive offensive against the British, and were gathering several regiments and numerous Indian allies at Fort Carleon. Roughly about 8,000 men in total, and they would be under the command of this guy you see here. This is, and I'm going to mispronounce his name, it's a long name, so I have to try it. Here we go. Louis-Joseph de Montcalm Grosan, Marquis de Montcalm de saint Veron. Yeah, um, just Montcalm. Is, that's, we're just going to go with that. any case, at the same time, the British, who were under the command of Brigadier General Daniel Webb, who, um, let's just say, his name's not quite as epic, um, they saw this massive influx of troops near Carleon and set scouts, specifically Connecticut Rangers, under the command of Israel Putnam. They scouted the area and, in fact, confirmed the buildup of forces, and it was obvious that they were preparing for a massive strike. In response to this, Webb reinforced Fort William Henry's garrison with 200 extra regular soldiers and about 100 militia, mostly from Massachusetts. This brought the total garrison of Fort William Henry to around 2,500 men, all under the command of Colonel George Monroe. Um, uh, just important to note here that the 44th, which were the original inhabitants and garrison of Fort William Henry were replaced with Monroe's 35th Regiment of Foot. So, anyway, the French advance guard under the command of Francois de Gascon began their advance on July 30th, 1757, with the main force under the command of Montcalm directly um, leaving a few days later. Gascon and his men, mostly Canadian militia, skirmished with the Massachusetts militia around Fort William Henry, which had recently arrived at the fort, and by August 3rd they had blockaded the road leading to Fort Edward. Webb, back in Fort Edward, did not send reinforcements to Monroe since he was the last line of defense between the French and a potential strike on Albany. So basically, if Fort William Henry fell, uh, Fort Edward would be the only line of defense between them and Albany, which simply was unacceptable. He urged Monroe to negotiate as best he could, and the message that Webb sent to him was intercepted by Montcalm, letting Montcalm know of Webb's inactivity, so basically he knew that he had a free reign to do as he pleased, and that the British would not be sending any sort of relief force for William Henry. So emboldened by this, the French offered to negotiate a surrender of William Henry, but Monroe refused. 
With this, the siege of Fort William Henry had begun. The French began by constructing a trench line around the fort, and in which they would use to protect and emplace their artillery, and on August 5th, heavy French artillery opened fire at a range of about 2,000 yards. The French continued on with their trench line, inching it closer towards the fort, and by the next day, another battery, only 900 yards away, opened fire, and it was positioned further down the trench from the original battery, so the Northwest Bastion, which is the main target here, was bracketed by two different uh, angles of attack, one um, directly at it, another one at another angle, so basically it was like this um, cone of fire that was concentrated right at this particular point. Uh, the British, to their credit, did return fire, but several of their guns were soon out of commission due to either overuse or stress on the metal um, of the cannons themselves, and overall had a very negligible effect on the French. Also, at this point, it's important to note that a number of the garrison of Fort William Henry was, were ill at this point, and many of them were coming down with smallpox, which further hampered the British resistance. On August 7th, the French, under a flag of truce, delivered Webb's in intercepted message to Monroe. On August 8th, there was more bombardment with trenches now 250 yards away. I mean, that's basically rifle range muskets. A bit far from muskets, but I guess, you know, if you angle it up, you might be able to get a shot off. Uh, but really, they're very, very close, and um, they're in a absolute had an absolute stranglehold on the fort. So with this, Monroe took stock of his situation. So the French were closing in, they were, again, like I said, nearly in musket range. The walls were breached in several different locations, and the northwest bastion of the fort was completely in shambles. They were greatly outnumbered, at least four to one. There was a smallpox outbreak going on amongst his men, and there would be no help of any reinforcements from Webb or any other force. So, with this in mind, he was forced to surrender the fort on August 9th. Now, the French were overall very impressed that the British managed to hold out as long as they did, and they actually offered very generous terms of surrender to them. Now, the final terms of surrender for the British garrison of Fort William Henry are as follows. The British and their camp followers and non-combatants that were there with them would be allowed to withdraw to Fort Edward under French escort, where they would be allowed to keep their colors, their regimental standards and banners and such, and they would refrain from fighting against the French for another 18 months. The colonial militia would return to their homes. They would also be allowed to keep their muskets and a single cannon, mostly it was a symbolic thing. Um, again, they're going out with the full honors of war, but they would not be allowed to bring any ammunition or gunpowder with them. In addition, British authorities were to release French prisoners within the next three months. So overall, it was actually very generous terms that the French gave the British in this particular case. So on August 10th, the British garrison began its withdrawal towards Fort Edward under French escort. Now it's at this point that the massacre of the garrison of Fort William Henry is supposed to have taken place. Now in the movie, it's de depicted as an act of betrayal by the French in that, um, you know, Montcalm is seen talking to one of his Indians. Indian leaders saying, uh, you know, it would be very, you know, something along the lines of very unfortunate if something were to happen along the road when we're not there to stop them. You know, and then it's kind of like the French are orchestrating this. More than likely, that's not what happened. Now, as far as we do know, Montcalm made it clear or tried to make clear to his Indian allies what was going on here, that the British would be allowed to withdraw and um, that there was actually somewhat of a language barrier. There were multiple tribes under the French at this point, and it's possible that there was some sort of language barrier or some sort of misinterpretation of what Montcalm meant by um, releasing the British and what was going on here. That There's another theory that states that the Native Americans were angry at the French for allowing the British to leave, given that, the, um, you know, that they wanted uh, basically scalps and other trophies of war, and that they were promised this by the French, and now this wasn't um, going to happen, so they got angry and took matters into their own hands. Uh, more than likely, though, the French were not complicit in this. So, anyway, as the British garrison was evacuating the fort, they were initially staged near the French camp, just as a way to, you know, get, gather them all together, organize what's going on, and then they would leave the next day towards Fort, um, fort Edward. The Indians then entered the fort that was now unoccupied by the British garrison and killed a number of the wounded that were still there and a number of the sick that were still there. As the British and their French escorts tried to leave the next morning, the Indians swarmed around them and uh, basically launched a series of attacks against them. They would try to grab for valuables and other items, mostly weaponry and clothing and that sort of thing, but also would sometimes carry off people, including women and children and other non-combatants. 
While this was going on, another group of Indians broke into the fort once again and attacked a number of wounded and injured that were under the care of French physicians. As the last of the British made their way out of the French camp, the rear of the column was attacked by a group of Abnaki Indians who killed and scalped several of the men and made off with most of their valuables. Many of the French, including Montcalm himself, did their best to try to restrain the Indians from attacking the now beleaguered British. Uh, however, many French simply did not. Now, there's no explanation as to why the French did nothing, or many of the French did nothing at this point. It's possible that they were somewhat happy about it. Uh, you know, the British were still their enemies, and watching your enemies get massacred, hey, that's a, such a bonus. And it, hey, the blood's not on my hands either. It's the, the, you know, the Native Americans, they did it, not us. And if that happens, you know, they're not losing sleep over it. That's a possibility. And there's the other possibility that they saw what was happening and they just didn't want to get involved. It's like, you know, there's two people fighting and, um, you know, do you really want to step in the middle of that? You know, people like, you know, you're at a bar and they're swinging bottles at each other and, you know, blood's flying around, they're swinging pool cues. And like, are you going to step in the middle of that? You know, they probably thought, yeah, we're not, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to do that. So, um, yeah, they stepped out. In any case, because of French inaction, that definitely brought the death toll much higher than it needed to be. So while these attacks were going on, the British column broke apart and many of the British fled into the woods, eventually making their way to Fort Edwards on their own. The main column with Monroe in it pushed on southward and eventually made it to Fort Edward with about 500 people. Um, over the next couple days, more and more filtered in until the totality of the fort's garrison eventually arrived at Fort Edward. Overall, it is very difficult to get an accurate casualty count of the people that were killed during the so-called massacre. There are some estimates that place it at a few dozen, you know, maybe about 60 or so. Some put it as high as about 1,500, which I find the 1,500 very difficult to believe on account of, um, you know, uh, the whole garrison was a little over 2,000. So 1,500, no, not really. That, that's kind of excessive. Uh, most modern historians place it somewhere around between 60 and maybe 190, thereabouts, give or take. Um, again, a lot of this is difficult because many of those who, kill, who were killed were family members, camp followers, and they weren't part of the military garrison there, so therefore their names and um, their numbers wouldn't have been recorded on any sort of official list. So it's very difficult to uh, determine those numbers anyway. Also, it's important to note that many people were taken captive, especially amongst the camp followers, and uh, many of them would be returned to the British later on. In the aftermath of the siege, Montcalm would order Fort William Henry to be dismantled and destroyed, and what you see here today is not the original fort. That would be based on archaeological digs from the 1950s. The British would not recapture the fort or would attempt to rebuild it after the war was over. It was basically dismantled and basically forgotten about until um, archaeological digs in the 20th century. General Webb would be recalled for his inactivity in the face of the enemy. Um, though I personally believe he was somewhat justified, I mean, you know, Fort Edward, if that fell, if he sent reinforcements and Fort Edward fell eventually, well, then there would be an open route down the Hudson towards Albany, and he couldn't take that risk. So I can't say I totally blame him, but, you know, the, the British High Command, they totally did blame him, and uh, he was recalled. Colonel Monroe would die in November of that year from a stroke, possibly brought on by the stress of what he experienced at the siege. Montcalm would continue to command French forces. He would not push on Fort Edward due to a number of factors. Uh, many of his Indian allies had simply left at this point, and his Canadian militia, men that were under his control, were needed back in Canada to help with the harvest. He would eventually be killed during the Battle of the Plains of Abraham during the Siege of Quebec later on in the war, where he would be buried. As for the paroled members of the 35th Infantry that had survived the siege and the subsequent massacre of the garrison, they thought that the terms of the agreement were violated since they were attacked while they were under French protection and therefore they were no longer bound by the agreement. James Abercrombie, who eventually took control of the British in this particular theater, did agree with them and by 1758 they were already campaigning with the British with General Jeffrey Amherst against Lewisburg, which would be an ultimately successful campaign. Amherst, who later on would preside over the British capture of Montreal, refused to give the surrendering French full military honors in memory of what had happened to the garrison at Fort William Henry. So the events of Fort William Henry would later on be immortalized in James Fenmore Cooper's 1826 novel, The Last of the Mohicans, which would be adapted for film several times over, most famously in 1992. I, we've already gone over this at the beginning. And um, yeah, there you go. So, that's it for the video. Please hit the like and subscribe button. More videos will be coming out whenever I get around to it.
and have a good day. Or don't have a good day. You're adults. You can have any kind of day you want. See you later.